Uh, this is not a scholarly presentation. It's just about my love of doll quilts. I'm a quilt maker and a quilt collector. And as I collect quilts, I find my, I see myself saving them from being destroyed or unappreciated and lost. I like everything about quilts. I like to make them, buy them, sleep yes. under them, <laughs> collect them, talk about them, show them. I like everything about quilts. And I make doll quilts and I buy old doll quilts. Now this has uh, led to collecting doll beds. I feel that the doll quilts look their best on little beds and so I have I would buy a doll quilt and I would bring it home and it was too big for the bed I had. So I had to buy another bed. <laughs> and then I would have one and it was too small so I needed to buy another bed. So it has resulted in collecting doll beds also. Now I especially like old quilts. Old quilts give us a sense of history. The American public is coming more and more to value artifacts of past lives because they tell us about the experience of life in a different time. And quilts, like other works of art, are the reflection of cultural and sociological attitudes of a particular time and place. In considering doll quilts, we need to think about crib quilts because doll quilts are just an imitation of crib quilts. And when making a crib quilt, we show a compelling, instinctive need to wrap a baby, surround him with soft, reassuring warmth. And I think crib quilts and doll quilts are most, attended, most tender and personal of all quilts. Every quilt I have, I want to know who made it. Who was the maker? What was her world like? She named her pattern Bear's Paw. Churn Dash, Sugar Loaf. That tells us something about her world. And maybe she couldn't even vote, but she named her pattern Lincoln's Platform or Clay's Choice. I can't tell you much about my old doll quilts because make, most of the makers are unknown. Doll quilts were not considered important. Sometimes they were just made of leftovers and they received hard wear, and so they were just discarded. If you are making a doll quilt, or if you have one from your past, will you document it? Tell us who made it, when it was made, the story about it. Maybe it was made for Annie when she was three years old. Because a hundred years from now, somebody will find that quilt, and they will cherish it because they know about it. Well, who made doll quilts for children? And what did the making of a doll quilt for a child signify to the mother, the grandmother, the older sister who made it? And why are doll quilts so wonderful? Is it the design, their color, the size, the sentimentality? Well, for me, they just have a special charm. Two of the antique ones just called out to me. And if you have two of anything and are a collector, then you have to get more. <laughs> antique doll quilts especially interest me because of the fabrics in them, old fabrics. And on the back, some of the leftover fabrics. They kept fabrics in their scrap bags for many years. And so some of them were just put in the doll quilts. I wonder who made them, and what was the child for whom they were made, and what kind of a doll did they cover? I've read that in the 19th century, dolls were made in the form of little women. They wore the latest Paris fashions, where they cuddled and put to bed and covered with a quilt, because baby dolls were made later. <laughs> 
I've read that very few dolls were made in America in the 1800s. Those that were there were made in Germany and France. The ones that were made in America were probably made of cloth and rags. And those are my favorites anyhow because they're soft and cuddly. And I have a collection of Raggedy Ann dolls. There were doll cradles and doll beds in the 19th century. In one book, there's pictured a doll bed dated 1840. It was a rope bed, a four-poster rope bed. In another book, there's one made in 1850 and one made in 1860. They were hooded cradles. Colonial homes were cold and drafty, and I think the hood on the cradle protected the baby. And those pictured in the books were beautifully made by craftsmen. But I think there were plenty of homemade doll beds made out of scrap lumber and leftovers. And I have here this little quilt, doll quilt says 1878 on the bottom. And I know it's made out of scrap lumber because they're still printing on the lumber. And it was very homemade. Another one is just made out of a tin can. Somebody spent a lot of time making all those little curly cues on the tin can. Another one was just made out of a box and it had close pins on the corner for the posts. And these weren't pictured in books, but I think they were used and loved just as much as the others. Well, children used to make do with very little except their imagination. And they would make dolls of anything, sticks, corn cobs, handkerchiefs. Here's a corn cob doll. It has a little roll of string on the top for a head. Here's one made out of a handkerchief with a stone caught, tied in the middle, in the corner for a head. Christiane Fisher in her book, Let Them Speak for Themselves, Women in the American West, 1849 to 1900. She quotes a lady, my one great love and joy was Diggy. She was my constant companion for many years. Sometimes she was just a stick, sometimes a handkerchief with a stone tied in the corner for a head. I could always talk to her and tell her all my troubles, and she was a great comfort. Well, girlhood in the early 1900 was meant to be preparation for what was perceived to be her life work, and her parents were her models. And in early days before the sewing machine, Women had to make all the clothing, bedding, linens by hand. So sewing for girls was a very important skill. I have here in this book, Anonymous Was a Woman. Don't you love that title? Okay, this has Lucy Larkham's Diary of 1889. She says, I think it must have been at home while I was a small child that I got the idea the chief end of woman was to make clothing for mankind. This thought came over me with a sudden dread one Sabbath morning when I was a toddling thing, led along, along by my sister behind my father and mother. As they walked arm in arm before me, I lifted my eyes from my father's heels to his head and mused how tall he is and how long his coat looks, how many thousand, thousand stitches there must be in his coat and pantaloons. I suppose I have to grow up, have a husband, and put all those little stitches in his coats and pantaloons. Oh, I never, never can do it. A shiver of utter discouragement went, went through me. With that task before me, it hardly seemed to me as if life were worth living. <laughs> 
and I went to meeting, and I suppose I forgot my trouble in a hymn. Well, sewing skills were passed from mother to daughter and teacher to pupil, and little girls as young as three years old learned to sew. Girls and boys were taught to sew before they were, learned, before they were taught to read. In 1877, Annie Frost said in her publication, Ladies' Guide to Needlework. It is generally our first work and our last. The schoolgirls' little fingers set their first crowded, crooked stitches of appalling length on patchwork squares, while the older woman, who can no longer conquer the intricacies of fine work, will still make patchwork quilts for coming generations. Upper-class girls were taught the gracious life they were taught needlework and manners and sent to finishing schools because idleness was considered to be the work of the devil if he could find anybody idle. And we can see the connection between quilt making and other virtues that are being taught. Perseverance, neatness, patience, family ties. Catherine Beechner, in her treatise on domestic economy, 1855, wrote, every girl should be taught to do the following kinds of stitches, overstitch, hemming stitch, running stitch, felling, back stitch, buttonhole, chain stitch, whipping, darning, gathering, cross stitch. I can't do all of those. Do you even know what they all are? <laughs> but they had to learn to sew. This is a little sewing sampler that some little girl made. And she not only learned how to sew, she made intricate little eyelets. She learned how to knit. She learned to do fancy buttonhole stitch. And she learned how to patch. Here are her patches. If you look at the front, you can't tell where she patched because the stripes all match and make perfect for her sewing. So they had to learn to do that. Um, Mid-19th century di diaries, we see references to children having completed quilt tops before age five. The Nebraska Quilt Project found a quilt by Edith Bell Sims. She started at the three years of age in 1919. Her mother cut out the pieces, marked the sewing lines, and pinned it. And when Edith learned to sew on a sewing machine, she finished the top by the age of six. And it was put away until her marriage in 1936. And it's here in our book the quilt that she made, we found that she made when she, the top when she was three years old and finished it when she was six years old. That's our Nebraska Quilt Maker book. A doll always has been a favorite toy and a doll needs a bed and a bed needs covers. So the incentive to make a doll quilt might start with your first doll and she tried to make an environment like her own. Now, Carolyn, you can hang up. You can hold this up if you'd like. You wouldn't buy this. It's all puckered up in the middle. It's not pretty. The colors aren't pretty or anything. But I had to have it because it had a card attached. The card said, Mama made this when six years old, 1904. But who was Mama? The touching thing to me is that somebody saved it, somebody labeled it, so that I got it and I knew that much about it. And these are the throwaway fabrics of 1904 and before, because they saved their fabrics for many years. I think this little saying applies here. Some stitches are big, but I don't care because I know your hands work there. Not all girls like to sew. 
A Mrs. Dayton says her grandmother made her do a stint of sewing every day and do it over before she could go out to play. She said she thought that those quilts would never need washing as they had been soaked in tears enough to keep them slow, keep them clean for a lifetime. <laughs> now another one of Lucy Larcom's diaries in 1889, she says, we learned to sew patchwork at school while we were learning the alphabet. I was not other, over fond of sewing, but thought it was best to begin mine early. So I collected a few scares of calico and underput them together with my usual independent way without asking directions. I liked sorting those little figure bits of cotton cloth for they were scraps of gowns I had seen worn and they reminded me of persons who wore them. One fragment in particular was like a picture to me. It was a delicate pink and brown sea moss pattern on a white ground, a piece of a dress belonging to my married sister, who was to me bride and angel in one. I could dream over my patchwork, but I could not bring it into conventional shape. My sister, whose fingers had been educated, called my sewing goblings. I grew disgusted with myself and gave away all my pieces except the pretty sea moss pattern which I was not willing to see patched up with common calico. It was evident that I should never conquer fate with my needle. Mothers encouraged girls to learn sewing and a doll quilt presented an excellent opportunity. It was easy to hold and quickly done. A very small child might start with an unknotted thread to sew. Then she might try on a scrap of fabric to count the stitches and make regular stitches. Then she would advance to making probably a four patch or a nine patch block because they had straight seams. Curved seams were more difficult. My mother said that when she was a girl, she was told every girl should make a nine patch quilt by the nine, time she was nine years old. Early crib and doll quilts were made the same as adult quilts. The squares, the triangles, the diamonds, they were the same shapes. They were the same design, the same color, the same patterns, and many were just adult quilts in miniature. And if it's a true miniature, the pieces are reduced in size. This one is a true miniature. It's a copy of a quilt, a large quilt in the May Museum up in Fremont. And I was intrigued by the way the little pink pieces went across the, across the pattern. But it's a very simple pattern. It's just the way the colors were arranged that made it so nice. This is a copy of an adult quilt. Also, this one would be a copy of an adult quilt. The pieces are small. It even has a border on it. Now, sometimes the pieces were the same size as they were in an adult quilt. And this one was made Pieces are big squares, just like they would be an adult quilt. And to me, it was fascinating because on the back, there's wool, probably a piece of wool that they had left over. They were used for that. Or this one, the nine patches are the same size they would be in a large quilt. I think it would be in a little more attractive if she'd put blue across the top and across the bottom and she'd had a little border around it. And to me, the fascinating thing is the back as a surprise on the back. <laughs> Has nothing to do with the front. <laughs> 
So they had to be handled different in the overall format as when they had the little pieces. Very few doll quills were done in applique, if any. Few were made in wool. This one, I believe, is wool. And you can tell it's got some moth holes in it. It's a very small little log cabin quilt. And it has a surprise on the back also. <laughs> Sometimes early children's quilts with childhood themes were made from children's <coughs> handkerchiefs. And they had religious and holiday themes, and they taught industry, cleanliness, piety, patriotism. Early childhood themes were then found in the Victorian crazy quilts, where we see the little Kate Greenaway figures, toys, and animals. And also about this time, there were the red embroidered quilts, known as red work. They had quilts of animals, toys, Mother Goose, Sunbonnet Sue, This one, you can tell, was made for someone special because it has little hearts all the way around. And this is one of the, a red work quilt of the little Sunbonnet Sue's. <coughs> Some people hate Sunbonnet Sue's and some people love her. But in a certain period, in the early 1900s, it was a very popular pattern. Now, pioneer Nebraskan Grace Snyder, she had a stillborn baby. And she says in her book, No Time on My Hands, Bert made a coffee from a stout little ammunition box and I told kind old Grandma Hoke where to look in my box cupboard for a lovely little feather stitch doll quilt that Aunt Olive had given me. Perhaps it was like this. They wrapped the baby in the little quilt and laid her in the box. Bert buried the coffin at the foot of a little cottonwood tree. And when Grace was able, she went out and put a little frame of narrow boards around the grave. Around 1880, women's magazines began to show patterns for children's quilts based on the appeal to children. Then in the 20th century, women had more labor-saving advices, saving devices, and they were freer to indulge in the sentimental side of quilt making. So she made quilts with animals, nursery rhymes, pastel colors. This one's called the attic window, and down in each little window, there's a print of a Beatrix Potter print. This is not a copy of an antique quilt. This one is just embroidered figures. It has that lavender and yellow, which just yells out 1930s. These are not quilts made like adult quilts. They had appeal to children. That was in the 20th century. That was a pattern in Hershberger's catalog in 1951. And this one of the little lambs. It was printed on the fabric. The lamb was and everything. And she never did finish it because some of those circles, she didn't finish quilting around it. Maybe she just didn't realize that she hadn't finished it. But the back has a surprise on the back. 
I've read that it was not until the 1930s and 40s that we were saying pink for girls and blue for boys. Now today, are we making doll quilts for our children or for ourselves? For my 17 grandchildren, I had 13 granddaughters. I've made 17 baby quilts and 13 doll quilts. They were to be used, dragged around, abused, and enjoyed. Do our little girls really play house in this TV era of women's liberation and computer games? Do they play with their dolls? Are the dolls made today for adults and collectors more than children? There are so many do not touch dolls. My niece had a little girl and she was given a doll and she said, Mama, can I play with this or is it just for decoration? So many dolls today are so beautiful, we don't want them to be played with. I read of a large collection of Barbie dolls, all in their original boxes, put away until she was older. Now I've brought a few more quilts, and I've put them in categories. I have those that I think were made by an adult. These are just my ideas. And then I have those that were made by a child, I think. I have some that were made in haste, some that were little mini quilts, some that were just tied. So, perhaps the most beautiful doll quilts were made by adults as a creative expression. They were treasured and some received very little wear. I don't think this one was ever used. Adult made quilts, so, show a little extra measure of tenderness and care. They were made with love for someone special. This pattern is called the mill wheel. Okay, this one is called Trip Around the World. I think it was adult made. It would have been very difficult to get all of those pieces the right pattern and get them all to go around in the right, in the little circles and so on and so forth. And I'm quite sure this is an, an adult made. You're all familiar with the grandmother's flower garden quilts. And this one, are, they are miniatures. The border is very gorgeous. But she's made a scallop to two colors of yellow. I don't think it was made by a child. Now this one, I think, is a learning experience. On the left side, these are four patches. On this side, there are four patches in a square. Then she doesn't get all of the sashing doesn't match up, doesn't match here, doesn't match here. I think it was a learning example, and she learned to do her four patches in different ways, and she couldn't get her sashing to all match. I think this one was made by a child. I couldn't make this. I'm too programmed to know that all the pieces should be the same size. <laughs> all the corners should match. All the sides should be the same dimension. It looks just like one Carolyn showed us yesterday from Korea. It was called, what was it called? Pajagi, Pajagi quilt. And I believe this one is probably made by a child. It has little pinwheels in the middle. Then it has some smaller squares around one side and some larger squares, squares around the other side. And in our exhibit, we have two little tiny ones that are, I'm sure, made by a child. And the edges certainly don't come out even and don't match or anything. Now, miniature quilts are precious and charming. Maybe they were made for a small doll or a small doll bed, and sewing small pieces is very difficult. 
This is what we call a yo-yo quilt. These are little yo-yos that were all gathered up in little circles. And it's also very hard to make your little circles round when you do that. It's definitely a miniature. This is a miniature quilt. It's a, what we call a whole cloth quilt. There's no piecing, no applique, just the quilting is the pattern. And she drew the pattern on with a blue pencil of some kind. It has fringe around the edge, and it was made for a four poster bed. So the corners are cut out for the post. This is also a miniature quilt made by Kate Adams, who lives in Maine. She makes these out of vintage fabrics. This was made in 1988. She still makes these. Now she makes them and frames them. And they're very beautiful and very miniature, all made out of vintage fabrics. This is one of her earliest ones that she hadn't framed. Now, a quick way to finish a quilt is by tying rather than quilting. Children who wanted the finished product and didn't enjoy the hand quilting, they might tie the top to the batting and the backing with yarn, heavy thread, string, or adults pressed for time could also resort to tying, some kinds, sometimes called tufting, tacking, knotting. I think this one would have been a little more attractive if she'd cut the threads off a little bit. They seem like they're a little too long, but it, the rest of it's very nicely done. And this one is a little older one. It's a tumbler pattern, and it's tied. It has those blue calicos that we like so much. Now, busy mothers and grandmothers could use leftover blocks and fabrics to hastily make a doll quilt. And to speed up the process, they were often tied rather than quilted, and quilted on a sewing machine. And some were neither tied nor quilted, but simply lined. This, I think, was made out of some leftover blocks, and she just lined it. And someone enjoyed it very much. This one is just made out of stripes, strips, strips of fabric, old fabric. But something happened to that quilt, and it happened much later. Those patches are much later than the fabrics in the original quilt. And you can show the back, it also has patches on the back. <laughs> and has that old green fabric on the back. I think the dog chewed it. <laughs> Maybe it got caught in a wagon wheel. But somebody patched it and she used it. Now, sometimes a large quilt was very stained or worn, but had an area in good condition, which was cut off and made into a doll quilt. You can tell by the pattern that this was cut off of some quilt because the pattern doesn't come out right. Okay. Now, when you collect doll quilts, ask, is the design in proportion? Are the pieces small? Does it have a border? Is the binding too new? Is it just cut off and then bound? Is the backing fabric in keeping? Antique doll quilts are very scarce and very expensive. If it's a true doll quilt, as well done in good condition and has documentation, that adds a great deal to the quilt. Our appreciation of these quilts is perhaps less dependent on their artistry than their naive charm. <laughs> 
Few doll quilts have survived, probably due to hard use, and they were subject to wear and tear, and fewer were made than large quilts. They were not considered collector's items years ago. They were attributed little value and thrown away. Today, crib and doll quilts are very desirable to collectors. This is due to their manageable size. They're easy to hang and display. Also, they're not as expensive as large quilts. Mothers, grandmothers, aunts, older sisters, little girls, yes, little boys made doll quilts. For me, each doll quilt, whether beautifully made, hurried assembly, assembled, or showing the workmanship of a beginner, it has its own special charm and meaning. And I wonder about the child for whom it was made and the person who made it. But document your quilts. They may last longer than you do. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh... I do have a list of books about doll quilts. Most books are about crib quilts, and they have a page or two about the doll quilts. Sandy Fox's Small Endearments is the best one, and Bruce Johnson's Child Comfort is also very good. The rest of them just have a few pages about them. So if you want to look at my list, of and we're going to have a book written about our dog quilts for the International Quilt Studies Center. <laughs>